Dzień dobry, witam wszystkich. Do jakiego mam mówić, przepraszam? O music. Welcome everyone uh, to tonight's event. It's my great pleasure as a rector of uh, Vistra University to welcome in our premises uh, Mr. Tilo Sarazin. He does not need uh, an introduction uh, because he is famous for his views on the fact that Europe does not need Euro, should be abolished quickly because it brings more harm than good. Uh, he also was an uh, active politician, but also a member of the board of the Bundesbank. Uh, and uh, today's event, uh, we'll have his introduction first, uh, and then uh, we'll follow by the debate. And I'm pleased to introduce the panelists of the debate uh, uh, in alphabetical order, Jakub Borowski, uh, who is a member of the uh, Prime Minister Advisory Council in English, whatever the... Uh, Economic Council, uh, and also Chief Economist of the Credit Bank of the Credit Agricole Polska, uh, Stefan Kabalet, former Vice Minister of Finance, uh, a Chairman of the Board of Capital Strategy Advisory Company, and also a co-author of the European Solidarity Manifesto, available on the, on the website, uh, Dr. Marcin Piątkowski, um, who is uh, Associate Professor at uh, Koźmiński Academy, and former advisor to uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. Also uh, has various other activities, uh, high profile activities. And my, myself as well, Rector of uh, this very university. Uh, this event is organized jointly by the uh, MK Publishing House, by Kazimierz Płaski Foundation and the Vistula University, which welcome you warmly in this very nice evening, uh, albeit a bit cold. And we will begin by warming up by the uh, key messages from our honorable guest, Mr. Tilo Sarazin. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mr. The Mr. Rector, I have to say, or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, the, the title of my book is that Europe does not need the Euro. I will tell you why it does not need the Euro. But the title of the book is not that the Euro means uh, uh, doomsday or that the Euro should be abolished. This, these are quite, uh, this, uh, this is not, uh, this, uh, this does not stand in my book. Uh, well, when, when uh, after what do I mean with the Euro does not need the, uh, the Euro? Uh, uh, currency is not uh, the purpose in itself uh, the currency is an instrument for uh, achieving uh, important aims. And, and with regard to Europe... Let me first be seated because the microphone will be... Uh, so, okay. And, uh, and, there was, and there was regard to the, the Euro, I uh, uh, identify three possible aims. First, promoting the peace in Europe. With Europe, I always mean the European Union, of course. Second, the promoting growth and wealth in Europe. And third, uh, the promoting labor and the employment in Europe. Let's start with the first. Europe, the, uh, not the European Union had been a peaceful place uh, when, the, when the Euro started in 1999. It is now a much less peaceful place uh, uh, as it was uh, then because the euro brought tensions and it brought discussions, it brought heated debates, it brought unrest and so on. So certainly the introduction of the euro has not improved peace and uh, the friendship that was in Europe. Second, growth. And with growth goes always wealth, as you know. Let me uh, tell you about, uh, about Germany. We, we, we hear always, and I'm, and, and I'm sure uh, I will hear it uh, again in, in this discussion, that, uh, that the Germany has the profited most from the euro. I read the statistics differently. In the, uh, the 60s, the average growth of the, the German 
the economy was 4.4 percent, the average real growth. In the 70s, it was 2.9 percent. In the 80s, 2.6 percent. In the 90s, the 1.6 percent. And uh, uh, in the last decennial, from 2000 to 2010, the, the economy in uh, the Germany grew by 1 percent per year. Uh, the export growth had been uh, much higher in the 70s, 80s, and 90s than it is now. The ex our ex exports don't grow as uh, strongly anymore. Of course, there is, uh, there is no need for that. We are exporting enough. But the export growth is especially slow to the other countries who have the euro. It's much, it's much faster to Eastern Europe, to the United Kingdom, to Sweden, China, the United States, and so on. Actually, the share of the, of the currency union in, uh, in the German uh, the foreign trade is, is declining. As regards to the labor market, our the labor market profits from the, from the reforms by the Chancellor the Schröder at the beginning of the last decennial, this is what, uh, what fosters uh, the German labor market and what has improved the figures. This uh, did not come from, uh, from economic growth. So the, uh, the euro, uh, to make it short, brought no advantages at all to the, the German economy. Up to now, it ha I have to admit that it has, it has not harmed the economy but it has piled up certain, certain risks by, by the guarantees uh, for aid for other countries. And now I come to the crisis countries within the euro. At the beginning of the euro time, they had profited from uh, the low interest rates, but uh, also uh, they had, they had uh, Cost and, and price developments which were higher than, than in Germany and which were in the end too high. And now they are caught in a situation to, uh, uh, in uh, the different degrees, but still caught in a situation where they have lost part of their the competitiveness, their costs and prices are too high. And so, because the exports uh, don't grow as they should, they uh, have a tendency to the stagnation and to uh, rising unemployment, there is, uh, there is rising the political unrest, and so on. So, the only thing or, or the thing that would help countries like France, Italy, or Greece, they immediately would be, a, would be a change of the exchange rate, a devaluation, as it often took place in the past. But, but this instrument has been lost, and this is their problem, and they do not have the strength and the willingness to, uh, to incur the reforms which, uh, which are necessary when one cannot, when one cannot uh, 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 not adapt to the, the exchange rates. And now to make my argument short, I come, I come to the, uh, the prospects of Poland. Uh, the, uh, the development of the, the Polish economy of the last two decennials has been favorable, as you all know, and it continues to be favorable. And of substantial help with that, uh, with that development was the, not the flexible exchange rate of the Polish the floti. Poland has experienced several, several changes in exchange rates in the years after, after, two, uh, after 2009. There was a substantial uh, depreciation of the currency which was, uh, which was the favorable for the, the competitiveness. And um, I think Poland was very successful in not adapted 
extend its costs and its wages uh, to the uh, competitive the environment. Uh, the, the wages, for example, are still, as, are still the lower than in Germany, but the gap is closing. And uh, now I come to the upside and downside if uh, Poland the joins the euro. The upside certainly is if you, if you not across the border, you uh, not a need not change money anymore. But, it, but, but this is about the only upside that I can discover. The downside is when you have, when you pass the through times with a weak economic performance, for example, when the, uh, the inflation is higher than it should be for some years, this can always happen, when there have, have, have been too much growth uh, of the level of wages, when the government is not able to drain in the public deficit sufficiently, then it takes only some years and, and you are caught in a, a situation similar to that uh, where, where France now is in, or Italy, where, you, uh, where your costs are too high uh, to be really the competitive and you have lost the main instrument to the correct sets which, which is a lower exchange rate. And uh, so the risk of the joining to the euro is the risk uh, of uh, the losing euro, the competitiveness, and not be able anymore to fine tune the euro economy. This is a substantial risk. But one has also, uh, um, uh, one must also see uh, that as far as I have observed the discussion in Poland from the outside, I only can observe it. <laughs> Uh, 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 when I read not the German newspapers, so when I observed is uh, from the outside, I have really not not discovered any argument, any sound economic argument. The main argument is an not the emotional one. Poland wants to join the club. Poland wants to belong to the core of Europe because it is part of Europe and this is uh, an uh, honorable uh, uh, desire, but it is not a feasible argument because uh, one does not join a club if the, if the, uh, the joining of the club offers nearly no advantages except for a good feeling but implies many unknown risks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sarazin. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this introductory, uh, introductory statement. Uh, now we'll follow by a debate. Uh, I will be a moderator. I'm a journalist for uh, Rzeczpospolita and Grzegorz Szymańczyk. I would like to remind you that uh, the discussion is uh, being translated, so everybody, uh, one can take uh, headphones here and. Uh, is in, in, in Polish. So uh, let me start the discussion. Well, uh, two, two years ago, uh, when Mr. Saratin's uh, book was, was published uh, in, in German, uh, uh, the Eurozone was in a, in, in a, in a disarray. So uh, the thesis that maybe the, uh, the monetary union will not survive was uh, quite popular. But uh, since then, a lot has changed, apparently. Uh, many economists attributed to the ECB actions. Um, uh, we have uh, an example of Ireland, which has uh, came out of the bailout program. Then we have Latvia, which joined uh, joined Eurozone, uh, which thinks that Eurozone still has some shine. Uh, and I wonder whether, in this light, uh, can we really say uh, that um, uh, can, can can we say that the crisis maybe was only a temporary turbulence, and in reality, uh, the Eurozone is still a success story? Let me uh, let me uh, start with uh, Mr. Cavales first. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I will uh, start with uh, saying that uh, uh, I think that uh, 
two, two European institutions, European Union and the common market, are real successes of post-war uh, Europe. And uh, actually, the survival of these institutions is vital for Europe, for peace in Europe, and for economic growth in Europe, and also for Poland. Uh, however, uh, Euro, the common currency, which was uh, thought as the next step to strengthen the integration, turned out to be a very serious uh, mistake. And uh, uh, actually, uh, during the current crisis, there are calls to defend Euro because Euro demise is uh, thought to be the end of uh, Europe. And uh, I may understand the, these views, but I think that uh, actually persistent defense of the Euro is very likely to have quite opposite uh, results. Because in, instead of uh, strengthening Europe and strengthening the European Union and the European market, it may, it may result in, in, desintegr in disintegration. The problem is actually very simple and fundamental and mentioned by Mr. Sarazin and by, by very, very many other economists. The, the problem is that uh, in Eurozone, individual countries are deprived for their own exchange rate, rate which, uh, and their own currency, which normally constitute fast and very efficient adjustment instrument, especially in times of uh, crisis. And uh, the uh, very problem of the thousand countries in the Eurozone, such as Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, is that these countries lost competitiveness and are not able to actually uh, uh, regain competitiveness. And actually, the actions of the uh, European Central Bank actually calm the markets because ECB proved that it's able to protect uh, uh, sovereign bond markets in the European U Union from uh, market uh, speculation. But this action is actually buying time. And we should think how to use this time to mend to mend the problem, because the very action of ECB did not resolve, uh, uh, did not resolve, uh, uh, did not resolve uh, uh, anything. The, these countries, uh, these thousand countries, are in prolonged recession, and uh, on the other hand, the northern countries in the eurozone are being asked to compromise their values of prudent financial policies and they are expected to finance themselves through endless bailouts. And this situation uh, risks the outbreak of serious social unrest in Southern Europe and uh, deeply undermines public support for European integration in the Northern European countries. And thus the Euro, instead of strengthening Europe, produces divisions and tensions that undermine the very foundation of the European Union and the common uh, market. And uh, according to International Monetary Fund, the un unemployment in Spain uh, will exceed 25% for at least five more, uh, five more years. It, uh, and uh, we may... Uh, we may figure out what may happen in Spain over the next five years if uh, unemployment will, st will stay at this uh, level. What kind of radical populist movement uh, will appear and gather popular support in the meantime? What would happen with the independent movement in uh, Catalonia, which has been gaining momentum amid the uh, Spanish uh, economic crisis? If the current crisis is prolonged for several more years, it is far from certain 
that Spain will retain democracy and uh, its territorial uh, shape. In Portugal, 87% pe people are dissatisfied with the democratic regime, and nearly half of the population positively assess the dictatorship which was overthrown in the 1970s, according to an, to an opinion poll. In Italy, already Eurosceptic parties uh, of Beppe Grillo and Berlusconi gathered a combined total 55% votes in uh, latest general elections. And the ability of democratic institutions in Greece to imposing consecutive austerity measures is uh, waning. The resilience of Greek democratic system can come to an end. Uh, to an end. And France has also competitiveness problems. And support for far-right National Front Party has increased substantially. Ahead of coming election for European Parliament, Eurosceptic parties are leading the polls in number of European Union parties, including France and, France and the Netherlands. And it is uh, hard to predict di political dynamics in, uh, in Europe. But uh, we have a dreadful historical parallel. This is the defense of gold standard in the interwar uh, period. And uh, European leaders of the time believed that the gold standard was the only system underpinning sound uh, currency. But contemporary, and they defended it by deflationary policies, the same policies which are actually prescribed to uh, southern European countries uh, uh, today. And contemporary economists admit that sticking to the gold standard was the key factor in the deepening and spreading of the Great Depression internationally that almost led to collapse of democratic orders all across the world. Uh, Sarah Moore, in, his, in her book, How Hitler Came to Power, shows that to big extent it was the deflationary policy of Heinrich Brüning, who was the chancellor of German we Weimar Republic between 1930 and 1932, that brought Hitler uh, to power. However, today the tragic paradox is that the southern countries which suffer from being in the current year zone, they could, sorry? Yes, sir. So, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you at, at this point, but let, let, let's, take, uh, let's give voice to other participants sorry. as well. I have seen that there were some intensive note taking on behalf of Mr. Piontkowski, so let's, let's, let's move to the other side of the table and start okay, the discussion. Please. Uh, okay, but, but let me uh, actually come to, uh, come to, the, uh, come to, the, uh, to the conclusion. Uh, uh, I am actually um, co-author of uh, a document uh, supported by a group of 20 economists from uh, 11 European uh, countries uh, that uh, uh, advocate a strategy under auspices of European solidarity, a strategy which is aimed to save the European Union and the single European market through control dismantlement of the Eurozone. And in order to avoid uh, panic in the thousand countries leaving the Eurozone, we think that the best strategy uh, to uh, uh, resolve uh, the Eurozone in a uh, controlled way is a strategy where uh, the Eurozone is uh, dissolved uh, in, through sequencing process, starting with the exit of, of the most uh, uh, competitive country, countries, uh, especially uh, Germany, the first. And it should be connected with uh, agreement on a new uh, currency coordination uh, system uh, in Europe uh, to, uh, uh, to avoid uh, excessive currency uh, fluctuation and currency, and currency wars.
Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Cavales. Let's, let's, let's move to the other side of the table. I have seen some intensive note taking. Mr. Rybinski, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, it was by accident. We didn't plan it, but I think we are sitting in a way that uh, the three of us here have a bit more sympathy to the euro than Stefan has. But uh, so uh, we'll see. Let's see. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I think the diagnosis about why countries in the south of Europe have problems is completely wrong. It's totally wrong. Uh, it's not about the euro. Okay? Euro facilitated something, but the problems they have is, uh, lies with two related issues, but not the euro itself. One, EU funds, European Union funds, and two, banksters, which is bankster is a word I'm using for combining banker and gangster. Okay, this is the bankster. Okay? Uh, what, what happened on the south of Europe is that they, they, they leveraged lack of competitiveness. Okay? So it's only the lack of competitiveness, it is leveraged lack of competitiveness that happened. And that's why they have this crisis. Why not Ireland? Because Ireland is a bit different and they're coming out in much better shape than, than the south of Europe. Now, what happened in the south of Europe and to some extent in Ireland? European Union told these countries, you guys, by yourselves, are not able to do anything. You are stupid, lazy, blah, blah, blah. You can you know, add some words that you, know, you can use. And we, the only way you can develop is you have, we hand you money. 3% you know, of GDP per year, 4% of GDP. You have it, grow. And they grew through, through this, you know, staying like this, like beggar style, you know, back hurts a bit, but handing out your hand and asking for more money. And over the years, they were unable to develop anything because they were just getting money from Germans, from Dutch, from others. So they developed economies which were focusing on developing through handouts from others, were not able to become truly competitive, with maybe North of Italy a bit different. And then came banksters. They said, ah, if the Eurozone introduction, it's a great place. Uh, uh, we, can, we can make a lot of money. I remember when I was still uh, deputy governor of the National Bank of Poland, I remember a statement by a former uh, uh, president of the ECB, Jean-Claude Trichet, who was saying, his usual stance like this, I see the only yield curve, the only one yield curve, which is the German yield curve. Now, every country has the German yield curve, and this is a great success. But that was the source of the problem, because banksters moved into these countries, completely ignored the risk premia, whatever, you know, and they just were making money on, on compressing risk premia, ignoring everything. And then coming to these governments, please, we lend you money, do this. Coming to people, we lend you money. So the problem is not the euro itself. It's the EU funds that grew this country into uh, uh, competitive, uh, less uh, black holes, focused on getting money for free from other countries. And there are banksters who move quickly to uh, make a lot of money hurting these countries. So solution would be stop, let these countries uh, develop their own capacity to grow. And if they're competitive enough, euro or no euro they can manage. And second, stop the banksters. And once we, if we stop the banksters and allow these countries to really develop uh, uh, their competitive edge, then they can live with, uh, with euro may happen with Euro, without Euro, but uh, focusing on the Euro as the source of the problem without with ignoring um, the other issues is completely wrong. And let me state it again. The only countries that have the problem today, Portugal, Greece, Italy, and Spain. And France. And uh, <laughs> France is um, a different league, I would say. Uh, they, they, have, they, have, uh, they have, these are the countries that benefited from from massive inflow of the EU money that killed their competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. So what, what about you, Mr. Borowski? Do, 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 do you think that the crisis was caused by the euro or it was the fault of certain sinners, uh, certain weak countries uh, who didn't obey by the rules? Okay, let me first of all uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this conference, so Professor Rybinski and also University of Vistula. Um, well, let me start with the diagnosis first, as it was done by, by my predecessor. First of all, I think that Euro has been made an easy scapegoat. So people think everything what, what is bad, everything what went wrong is related to the Euro. 
So let me uh, mention some factors that were behind this crisis and were, and were not related to the euro. First of all, the cyclical position of the world economy, the US economy and the euro area economy. It was those economies were, by some measures, overheated. So there was an excess demand, and finally the slowdown was inevitable, and the slowdown was dramatic, compounded by the second effect, which was the financial crisis uh, all over the world. These were two factors, and of course there were some other factors, domestic factors, domestic, domestically driven factors in the euro area, that made uh, those countries borrow more and more, that uh, fuel the domestic demand. Um, and uh, one of them, to make this debate a bit more heated, was the German approach to the problem. So 2003, the dilution of the Stability and Growth Pact, a very strong signal sent by the Germans and also French government to the other Eurozone countries uh, that, uh, well, the rules that we set up are not binding anymore. And actually, Mr. Sarazin is writing about it in this book, which I read with, with very great interest. So um, I think the issue is, is uh, much more complicated. That's the, that's the first thing. Second thing is this um, issue of exchange rate depreciation, competitive devaluation, the issue that was raised by Mr. Kavalets. I would call it a mirage of the exchange rate depreciation. Why? Because we know from the theory of economics and also from empirical findings that uh, you cannot resort to this instrument all the time. You can devalue, you can generate massive depreciation, but at the end of the day, in the long run, this is not the way to solve the problems. Krzysztof Rybinski was looking somewhere else, trying to point some banksters, trying to point uh, the cheap, easy money flowing to those countries. I, point, I, I would probably point to some other things like uh, non-effective macroprudential um, uh, supervision in those countries that let the credit grow too fast. There are, many, there are many explanations. So the exchange rate depreciation may be efficient in the very short run. However, to uh, discuss the, the Eurozone uh, experiences from the angle, from the point of view that was proposed by, by Mr. Cavales, then we have to ask the question, what would be the alternative scenario? So how the Eurozone would behave if, or the Eurozone countries would behave precisely if there hadn't been any Euro? So we would probably have massive exchange rate depreciations in the southern countries from time to time. So large exchange rate volatility, much higher interest rates, much lower inflow of foreign direct investment, and we know it because there have been research, very good research, suggesting that the inflow of FDIs to Eurozone countries until 2008 was between 15 to 200 percent. Of course, the uncertainty is large because there are various ways to, to study this issue. The trade effects, we know that maybe some positive trade effects related to elimination of exchange rate volatility. There were different studies on this issue. The, the last studies, they suggest it was quite moderate, quite small, however, it was there. So anyway, the Eurozone um, benefited uh, from um, exchange, rate, um, uh, exchange rate stability. Uh, the, the numbers that I have, for instance, and these are the numbers for Mr. Sarazin, I think they are quite interesting. These are the, the numbers derived from the Eurostat statistics. The exports of Germany between 1999 and 2012, they rose altogether by 72%, the exports to the other Eurozone countries. Then you are saying, well, uh, the problem is that the exports to the other countries, developing countries, they went much faster. And this is probably the signal that the Euro was not a success. This is not a signal that the Euro was not a success. This is actually totally in line with the trade theory. The trade is moving faster, is developing faster, where we have higher growth rate, the longer run growth rate. And actually, it's quite normal that the trade between Germany and developing countries, including China, was growing much faster than the trade between Eurozone countries uh, and Germany, because those countries are much more affluent and they cannot grow at the same rate. This is, this is I think, uh, quite... Uh, uh, quite understandable. And last but, last but not least, I, let me uh, make one uh, positive and optimistic point. I think here, 
at this table, everybody agrees that uh, the southern countries of Europe, they suffer from uh, institutional um, failures or, or, or they, lack, they lack good institutions. And then the question is following. If we didn't have the euro, would they improve their institutions? Would they reduce the black economy in Greece? Uh, while at the same time resorting to, the, to those massive devaluations? I don't think so. Market discipline. But there is no market discipline if we, if we have the country that have a flexible exchange rate and basically is using this as the, as the only factor because they don't have motivation to do the other uh, measures and introduce other reforms. And what is happening now? Step by step, I am not enthusiastic about it, but step by step, southern countries are forced to introduce those, change, those changes. Mr. Sarazin is saying in his book that the southern nations are, me I'm sorry, are mentally different. You are saying this in this book, that they are mentally different and they are unable to do it, finally, to change in the long run. This was, I think this was your point. So the last, the final point for me is following. I remember very well, and this is also the, the notion that was used in my generation, the notion of Polnische Wirtschaft. The notion that has been known to the generation of my parents and generation of people in, in the same age as, as I am. And if you ask the new generation in Germany what it means, Polnische Wirtschaft, they don't know. This country has changed. These people have changed because the system has changed. So I would say that in the long run, uh, it is a chance for Greek people, for Spaniards, for Portuguese to change their institutions as long as they are pushed by Germans, by the system itself. So, um, and I think the chance that they will reform it is greater than in a situation when they are outside the euro area. Thank you, thank you Mr. Borowski. <laughs> Before, before we give Mr. Saracin a chance to review these arguments, let, us, let, let me give the voice to, to Mr. Piontkowski first for his introduction. Um, first of all, let me congratulate um, Dr. Saracin for, for a very inspiring book. I, I enjoyed reading it. There's this uh, tour de force in many ways. Um, but I have to say that your main argument, which is that Europe doesn't need the euro it's an argument that I fundamentally disagree with. And I would argue that, in fact, Europe needs the euro because it knows that euro makes sense that it can work. I believe that Europe believes in the euro because Europe knows that the eurozone can be fixed and this fixing is already happening. And third of all, that Europe can and like, will likely, I'm not sure, why I don't have a 100% guarantee, but will likely succeed with the euro, because indeed Europe with the euro can reform more than in a, in a situation without the euro and without the eurozone. And let me now elaborate on, on the three points. On the first one, Europe makes sense, and there's a, a lot of countries that, that have benefited, and I actually find it quite bizarre that a German guy wrote the book from a country that was par excellence the main beneficiary of the introduction of the euro. Germany was the number one country that has put all the southern European country into a eurozone prison where they could not depreciate their, their way out into competitiveness. And if you look at any counterfactual, and Cuba helped me here, uh, Germany has increased its exports to southern Europe significantly more with the euro than would have ever increased without the euro. And I think this is, this is, this is uh, a pretty powerful evidence which could also be uh, shown later. So in fact, Germany has, has benefited by, not, by indeed not allowing southern European countries to depreciate their way to competitiveness, therefore to import less from Germany and export more to Germany, including Metaxa and Greek sunshine. And also, when you criticize German performance in the Eurozone or the Eurozone as a whole, I mean, if you look just at the data from the introduction of the Euro in 1999, German GDP per capita growth, you know, on an average income of an average, health, average Schmidt family in Germany has increased faster than in the US. 
the US with the supposed uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, Apple, Googles, and the, and the like. German GDP per capita from 1999 to 2012 increased by 12%. In, in the US, there was only 16%. So what is wrong with the euro? And in fact, as a digression, if you adjusted these GDP per capita numbers for the fact that the US is a totally dysfunctional economy, when more than half of newly created GDP goes to the top 1%, mostly banksters, as Professor Rubinsky would say, then you would see that, in fact, if you look at the median household or the income of a median German family versus American family, the gap between pr increase in prosperity in Germany and the US is even bigger than on the GDP per capita basis. So Europe can work, and it worked for some countries, in particular for Germany. So Dr. Sarazin, I mean, the, you really have to tell us how come you as a German would actually complain about it. I would understand if you're a Greek or Portuguese, but a Germany, that is somewhat strange. On the second one, why Europe believes in the euro? Because it can be fixed and is in the process of being fixed. First of all, if you look at the macro data, and I have to disagree with Mr. Kavalec, who says that that uh, Europe is still in a recession. In fact, it, not. Most of the Eurozone has come out of the recession. It is not true that uh, Eurozone is losing competitiveness. In fact, even the, the useless southern countries, the lazy Greeks, the, um, the dysfunctional Spaniards, uh, the not fully uh, concentrated and focused Italians, all of them are actually increasing competitiveness as we speak. The unit labor costs are decreasing. The costs of labor are decreasing, the productivity is going up, so the labor, union labor costs are increasing, uh, decrease, decreasing, and the gap between Germany and these countries that has accumulated in the past 10 years is actually quickly uh, shrinking. And I could obviously, we can all discuss for quite a long time, elaborate on all the institutional reforms that are happening, all the reforms that would never happen was it not for the Eurozone crisis. And by the way, was it not for the Eurozone crisis, Greeks, Spaniards, Italians, and all the others would never have an incentive to reform their ways. Why? Because they would just depreciate. They depreciate the currency. You know, it is like a shy, shy boy who wants to meet, meet a nice girl and get married. Um, there, are, there are two possibilities or two strategies. One, you drink alcohol, you become less shy, you come up to the girl and tr try to strike up a conversation. Works once, once twice, but at some point you have to stop drinking and you will have what, you really, what your real colors are. And there's a second strategy, which is you stop drinking and then you look at yourself how you can make yourself more attractive to this girl to find even a better wife. So instead of depreciating, which will be drinking this alcohol, I'm much rather these countries' fundamental reform with, within the Eurozone. And let me make the last point on why Europe can and will likely succeed. Uh, and this is more or less the point that we have to look at the counterfactual. I mean, all the countries that even Mr. Sarazin mentions it in the book, that in the run-up to the Euro, he was amazed at how much all these countries have done to actually be ready for the euro. The Italians, the Italians Wirtschaft, you would say. The Italians have done a lot. The Spaniards have done a lot. Okay, Greeks have fudged their numbers. That's fine. But these are the only Greeks. They are, they are peanuts in the euro. They lied about the numbers, true. But others have not lied, uh, lied about the numbers, and they've actually done their homework. And I think it's really unjust to now undermine the whole idea the whole idea of the Eurozone, just because American banksters have started the global crisis, because mind you, it was in the US that the crisis started, not in Europe, we had nothing to do with it. We're just paying the price for some, somebody else's uh, fault. And I think we are in the process of fixing our, our, soon to be our, in fixing on the Eurozone, and I think Euro is likely to come out stronger out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Yes, sir, and there are a lot of arguments for you to refer to, so the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, let me start uh, with, a, uh, with a question whether the Germany has the benefited from the euro. Uh, in order to uh, test that question, one has to look at the statistics. And I and I quoted the several statistics. I repeat one quote. The 
growth of the Europe of the, the German economy has never been as the slow as it was since uh, the introduction of the euro. The average real growth since uh, 2000 had, uh, has been 1% per year. And uh, the uh, growth in the, the 60s was, was, uh, was uh, at a 4.4%, and even in the, in the 90s, 1.6%. So this is quite clear. Growth has not been fostered by the euro. Secondly, uh, the, the, the German experts grow much the slower than they grew before the euro. In the 70s, when the, when the system of the Bretton Woods broke down and the, and the Deutschmark had appreciated by 50 to 60 percent against pound, pound, dollar and so on, the exports grew by, by the 180 percent from 1970 to 1980. In the, uh, in the 80s and in the 90s, the, uh, the growth of our exports was 80%. And, in, uh, and uh, from 2000 to 2010, the growth of our exports fell to 60%. I do not say that was because of the euro, but certainly the, the, uh, the figures do not prove that uh, the, the euro has accelerated our, uh, 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 our export growth. And the share of the, the euro countries has ever been, uh, been falling in our export statistics. Actually, we are running uh, export, an export deficit with, uh, uh, with Italy and with, uh, and with France. The problem is, or it's a fact, that uh, the German manufacturers' good, uh, goods are not very uh, not price sensitive, so we would be far better off if, if they were more expensive. And the fact is, uh, and this is the, the problem of the Eurozone, that, uh, that a Euro exchange rate, which is too low for the long-term well-being of the, the German uh, economy, is too high for the long-term well-being of Italy and of France. The industrial production in Italy is under the level of 2005. It's a virtual a catastrophe. The market share of France on the, the world markets has fallen from, uh, uh, from 8% to 6% since the introduction of the euro why the market share of, uh, of, of the Germany has risen, but even stronger has risen the market share of the Switzerland, which had a strong, which had a strong appreciation. So there is no statistical way uh, uh, to prove that uh, the, the euro was advantageous uh, for the Germany, but it, of course, had, had substantial disadvantages for the other countries. And, uh, and, uh, and what regards our, our uh, income than per capita and its growth in comparison to other countries, please, uh, please look up in the, the Polish, in the Polish edition of the book, uh, page uh, 80 and 81, and the respectively uh, page 85. There you see an index of, uh, of the real uh, the GDP based, uh, based uh, uh, the 1998, this was the last, last year without Euro 100, and there's the index in, uh, uh, in uh, the Germany stands at 119, and the index in, uh, in, uh, in the United States at, at, at 132, and so the Great Britain and Sweden and in the United States, all countries outside the, outside the, the Eurozone uh, grew the quicker than, uh, than the Germany and the, uh, not the Eurozone as a whole 
grew uh, the slower, uh, not than the rest of the, of the European Union. And if you look up uh, page, uh, page 85, there, there, there is a head per, uh, per capita in, in, in uh, the purchasing power parities. There you can see that, uh, that uh, the Germany has lost on his on his relative uh, uh, the standard compared to the to the rest of the of the union uh, the france has lost two uh, the netherlands have gained uh, so so it's a, it's a very mixed picture and and there is no sign uh, that uh, the germany has the profited in any way uh, so uh, there is no sign uh, of any advantages for Germany, that, but there are many signs of disadvantages for the other countries. I agree with you that the current crisis cannot, can only be explained by, by the several factors if you, if you aim to, complete, to explain it completely. And the, and the euro is only the one factor. I also stress, and I said that with, uh, in my book, in effect, we don't have a currency crisis because the euro is a strong currency. We have a crisis of uh, the competitiveness in certain countries of the euro. This is a problem. And uh, shit always happens. There is bad governance. Governance make make mistakes. There are errors. There are even banksters. There are all sorts of evil in the economic world, and uh, they will also and they will always be there. The question is: Is the country better off if it uh, can change its its exchange rate, or is it not better off? This is the question, and I have a long experience with France and Italy and the other countries. I, I, was, I was civil servant in the, the Federal Ministry of Finance since, uh, since the beginning of the 70s. It was when all the turmoil started. Uh, there are countries who have a higher the natural inflation rate because of their, of their internal structures. And, and uh, those, are the, those are the southern countries. There will also always be a tendency to a slightly higher inflation there. And if, you have, and if they have no means to, uh, to adapt to that, they will always have difficulties. Take, uh, take, for, exam uh, uh, take for example, Turkey. Turkey is a... Uh, the successful has been very successful over the last 15 years. The Turkish lira has has uh, depreciated by 80, not 18, by 80 percent since the beginning of the euro. And to compare that to the to Greece, at the beginning of the euro, the uh, capita per head in Turkey was. Uh, was 40% of the, of the Greek level. Now it is around 80% of the Greek level. So the euro did harm to Greece because it couldn't go the same way as, uh, did, uh, as did Turkey. And, and uh, uh, to the question of uh, changing mentalities, look, at South Italy and North Italy, there are, they are unified. They, uh, they were unified in 1860, to 150 years ago, and still there is this yawning gap in mentality between the, between the North and the South, which is even getting bigger. And I uh, seriously doubt that the mentality in Greece uh, will, will, will adapt uh, uh, to quickly to uh, not, uh, not the middle European standards. And um, so 
it's a matter of, of the philosophy. My philosophy is let countries seek their own way and let their concerns be their concerns. The problem with the Euro is that the, the lack of governance in other countries is all of a sudden our concern. This, uh, uh, this, uh, this used not to be the case. I'm quite happy that, that Poland can look after itself. Uh, if Poland joins the Euro, uh, the, the uh, state of the Polish economy and the outcome of Polish elections and whatever would, as, uh, would also be subject on, on uh, the European summits. I don't think that, that this is a good development. Let's combine our forces where we can do things together. This is a, this is a, a, a common market. This, this, uh, these are fair rules of the competition. And let's go our separate ways where uh, uh, this is a better for the, uh, for the, the single economy. Thank you. Thank you. Gent gentlemen, let, let me ask you to be more concise in, the, in, in your statement so that we can have some, uh, some, some discussion. I would like to ask one question to Mr. Piontkowski, who seems to be the most optimistic on the future of Eurozone. Do you think that if Eurozone is really in such a good shape, do you think that we should try to join straight ahead as far as possible? Uh, this, uh, should, should Poland join Eurozone as far as possible if, the, if, it, if Eurozone is such a good state? And let me start with Mr. Piontkowski because he is the most optimistic here. So, Let me s start by saying that I do not believe that Eurozone is such an optimistic state. I do believe, though, that it is in the process of fixing itself that it can and will likely succeed um, in the reform process. That said, as for Poland, my bottom line would be that Poland is, doesn't really want to yet and is not ready to enter the Eurozone, and the Euro doesn't want us yet and is not ready for, for us either. So I think up until at least 2020 and probably even beyond that, any talk about the Euro accession for Poland is political, theatric, and largely a waste of time. We can all have academic debates, but it's just not going to happen for all kinds of reasons, um, both that are internal to the Polish politics and Polish eco economic situation, and also to what is happening in the Eurozone. Uh, but if you ask me, would it make sense for Poland to eventually join? Yes, I would say at this stage it may, would make a, a lot of sense. In fact, the Eurozone crisis, I would argue, has been a blessing for Poland, in a sense that, first of all, it has depreciated, depreciated our currency, was it not for the Eurozone crisis, the Zloty would be significantly stronger and the Polish exports would be significantly lower. Thanks to the Eurozone crisis and all the bad Greeks and Spaniards and Italians, Poland has become the China of Europe in terms of price competitiveness. Not only that we increase um, our labor productivity faster than wage growth, but at the same time our nominal exchange rate is, is much weaker than the fundamentals. But also, and more importantly, will join the Eurozone, which will be institutionally and fundamentally much stronger than it has been before the crisis. And that has been the lack of, uh, the, the lack, uh, of procrastination and lack of, lack of execution. Poland, with, with some probability, could have already joined uh, in 2006 or 2008. You know, we probably we are that close. It was a number of decisions by leading policymakers we could have made it. But we didn't, and it turns out that probably was a lot of luck. And now we can just stand on the sidelines, continue to be China of Europe, increase our exports like there's no tomorrow, um, change and improve our economy structure towards exports that we were never strong in. I mean, we sucked. In Poland, this economy was never export-oriented, and this is changing as we speak. Our Poland export have increased from $6 billion in 1989 to $200 billion last year. And thanks to the Eurozone um, crisis, this, these, uh, these trends will continue. But to sum up, uh, Eurozone 
has a number of problems. I will be the last one to say that we should just relax and sit on the laurels and wait for, for the euro to replace the dollar on yuan in the future. No, not at all. I'm just saying that, is, that in fact, eurozone will work better as a reform anchor for the eurozone and for Poland, um, and for Poland to join um, the, the common currency around, not around, after 2020. Thank you. I, I, I see that you have a partial agreement here, uh, Mr. Mr. Saracin. What was your point on, on this? Well, this is, a, this, is a pretty, this is a pretty sensible and cautious approach. It says, uh, uh, wait and see. And I quite agree. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Borowski, I have seen you, you have been taking some, some notes. So. Okay, a number of points. Um, First of all, let me come back to this issue of Germany, because I think this is a, a crucial thing and one of the corner, corner issues of, uh, or the core issues of your, of your book. What you are saying, and I am translating it now directly, uh, it's difficult to notice the growth related to the common currency uh, in case of Germany. Let me now come back to the data that uh, Martin referred to, and I, am, I did a very simple calculation based on the data you provided in the book, so GDP per capita, mm -hmm. expressed as an as a EU average. So in the same period, from 1999 to 2008, GDP per capita uh, fell by 4% in Germany, 10% in the US, 10% in Japan, 5% in the UK, and there were only two countries important, let's say, the, the, not from the Euro area and quite comparable with Germany, so Sweden and Switzerland, which had somewhat better result, so 2% fall in case of Sweden and 3% uh, in case of Switzerland. So I would say Germany in that time did reasonably well. We have to make it relative, not absolute. Yeah, but not oh, because oh. of the Euro. No, maybe because of the Euro, Germany did it relatively well. In order to defend the thesis that the euro did not help, you have to decompose growth. Uh, so you have to make a counterfactual simulation. If you don't make it, the way to circumvent it is the way I, I tried to do it. So I pointed to some trade effects, I pointed to some FDI defects, suggesting Germany and euro area as a whole benefit. The second issue is the exchange rate depreciation. Yes, Poland benefited from exchange rate depreciation massively at the beginning of the crisis. But if you look at the research, and a very nice piece of research was delivered by the National Bank of Poland, you see that, that the major factor driving the depreciation of the slot at that time was the rising global risk aversion. So massive sell-off of assets, assets of emerging market economies primarily. It was not triggered by the interest rate differential. So it was not driven by monetary policy itself. It was the global phenomenon. Then let me move to another period, 2012 in particular, and the beginning of 2013. We had again, we had again loosening of monetary policy in Poland without any reaction of the exchange rate. Why? because we had a massive inflow of capital to emerging market economies because of quantitative easing in the United States. This is a beautiful example illustrating that this instrument of exchange rate adjustment may not be always efficient. And uh, we did a research in Credit Agricole with Christian Jaworski, he is sitting in the, in the audience here. Uh, the research based on the experiences of CE4 countries. So all the countries of the region having floating exchange rates, so Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, and Hungary. And uh, we show, and we will show the result of the research tomorrow at the competitive universities of Warsaw School of Economics, my alma mater, that the reaction of the exchange rate in those countries to the output gap was dramatically reduced. So, and we can imagine a situation like this in the future, that we will have, again, a strong recession, and the countries like the United States or uh, the UK will engage again in quantitative easing because they, found, they find it efficient. They are convinced that this is a, a good instrument, efficient instrument. And then 
the monetary policy in Poland will not be as effective as it was at the beginning of the crisis. So again, the mirage of the efficiency of this exchange rate instrument. I am not saying it's not helping. It's helping a lot, but sometimes it cannot be engineered by the monetary policy tools in a way we want it. Thank you, Mr. Borowski. <laughs> We are, we are, we are uh, running out of time, so let, let us uh, take a step uh, forward and try to, to, to find some solutions to the uh, troubles uh, that Europe is currently undergoing. I wonder, uh, just briefly, whether any of you gentlemen agree that uh, we should let the weak countries out of the Eurozone in the, in a, in the current situation? Mr. Kavalec, what's your opinion here? I said that uh, Eurozone should be dismantled, but from the other end, that certainly I would not advise uh, that we, we should start with uh, taking weak countries out of the Eurozone, because it would result in uh, banking panic in, this, uh, in, this, in these countries. Why, why do you think the strong countries are not following this, this advice? Why, why do you think the strong countries do not, are not willing to, 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 to get out of the Eurozone? Nobody, at the moment, nobody is, is leaving the Eurozone. But we have very dynamic political, political situation. And as many people say, the ECB protect us from market storms, and that the next crisis in Eurozone will be triggered by political, political development, which are very difficult to uh, predict, you know, day by, uh, day, by uh, day by day. But, but uh, one day it may happen that uh, Germany will follow this, uh, this advice, because this is uh, the most rational way of uh, uh, easing the situation in southern countries, because if Germany plus uh, some other strong countries leave the Eurozone, then uh, and uh, introduce new currency, then Euro will depreciate vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis, uh, these uh, uh, new currencies, so southern countries will have, staying with Euro, will have their currency, their currency depreciation, which would improve their situation without inflating of their uh, foreign debt and without uh, banking panic, uh, banking panic, uh, panic zero. I, I think Mr. Saratin is best suited here to answer why, why Germany doesn't follow that advice and to... If we talk about the leaving the Eurozone, we talk about politics. And politics uh, has its own rules, and therefore it's my prediction that the Germany will never leave the Eurozone. This is unpolitical thinking. Uh, but I think that there may come a situation, and it may be pretty near, that Germany says, we cannot incur further financial guarantees and we return to the principles of the Maastricht Treaty, which means no bailout. And, and once the Germany that declares or makes clear that there will no, be no further bailout, no, no increasing of the ESM and so on, then the other countries know that they are on their own. Uh, France knows it has to solve its own problems. Uh, Italy knows that. And by the way, these are the, uh, the, are the two most the problematic countries. And then they will have a choice. Either they, uh, they uh, make not the structural reforms and uh, increase their, their competitiveness, or they are confronted with uh, permanent stagnation, high, uh, high unemployment, and so on. And, and I, I don't know how this choice will work out, uh, but I think there is a high 
a likelihood that in the end uh, France will accept that it was not such a good idea to have uh, the common currency with Germany. And if France accepts this fact, it will leave the Eurozone. Maybe not the, not the, the, present, uh, not the, the present president, but, uh, but who knows uh, the, what will come about. On the other hand, if, the, uh, if French and Italy get their act together and uh, the reform the successfully, which I think is not very likely, then, indeed, uh, there could be a more stable the Eurozone. But to make this work in the long run, this would, uh, this would imply that the economic behavior and the structures of the problem solving within a society would get more dissimilar to the, the German and the Middle European ways. One could say, once we manage that uh, the Italians and French people behave like the Germans, then we wouldn't have any the problem in the Eurozone. But I think this is uh, very unlikely, and I even doubt whether it would be very desirable. Thank you. Uh, it seems that Mr. Cavallo has, has, has one, one comment on it. And, th and then Mr. Mr. Rybinski afterwards. Yes. I'm uh, quite close to Mr. Sarazin, but not, uh, not exactly, because I agree that the situation in France is very likely to be the trigger. Mm -hmm. But I think that the crisis with, with France will, may result with France's request to Germany to leave the Eurozone. And actually, we have in Germany a party, Alternative for Germany, set up by, actually by professor of economics mostly, which, uh, which may, we will see how will, uh, it will do in the next uh, election. In Finland, one of also the st strongest, more competitive country, there is quite a, a discussion, including the government, about the possibility of leaving. Uh, uh, of leaving uh, Europe, that the, this scenario of uh, starting from the most competitive country is not so uh, science fiction as some people uh, think. It may be a reality. Professor Rybinski. I, uh, I, th I think that you might be thinking that listening to economists is a schizophrenic exercise. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, economists look at the same data and come up with completely opposite conclusions. Not only slightly different, completely opposite conclusions, but look at the same table in the same book. Right. Second, you hear from economists that depreciation is bad because it uh, removes incentives from countries to reform, and the very next minute they will tell you Poland was in an excellent situation because we got depreciation. And Turkey as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. The third, economists, like 10 years ago, and I was a central banker, would say, central bank should keep inflation low. Our mandate is to have inflation stable, prices stable, inflation at 2% or close, that's it. Now, central bankers should try as hard as possible to print as much as possible to get inflation to five, six or more to help reduce the debt that politicians incurred over time in the private sector. So just a few years have passed and economists have shifted the consensus. Now the central bank should increase inflation and print the money. So what I'm saying is don't expect us as economists to find any solution to provide you the proper diagnosis because this is a bunch of schizophrenic guys who are talking, uh, uh, you know, funny language. All right? Second, uh, uh, I fully agree with Stefan and also with, with, with Mr. Sarazin that uh, uh, the polit political dimension of this is becoming important. Mm -hmm. And the European Parliament elections are coming, and we will see social preferences revealed this year. They will, they will elect some politicians. And very likely, the guys elected to the European Parliament this time will be a different bunch than we had last time. 
they be anti-euro, anti-euro bunch. Uh, you, you name the, the, you know, the, the uh, Marie Le Pen and others. And that's just, this is a very, a very dangerous process that may lead to unwelcome uh, outcomes in the Eurozone. So to me, discussing Polish membership in the Eurozone, uh, this uh, decade is a really a unwelcome uh, production of CO2 at times when global warming may be a problem. So uh, I would say uh, uh, we should wait and see. Uh, I would say that uh, crisis has only started, has not finished, has only started. We've just seen the phase one of the crisis, with phase two coming, and then phase three, maybe more, because the, the amount of debt that we uh, produced over the last 30 years in the world and in Europe uh, needs to be deleveraged, and we take a decade or more to do it. And over the next decade, we'll be in permanent crisis. Uh, and the right question to ask is, is Euro helping to solve the problem or not. And here, from five economists, you, you will hear five or more uh, recipes and diagnoses. So that's what I want to leave you. Uh, there is, uh, don't expect any consensus. Uh, it gets worse by the day. <laughs> well, last, last year there was a research uh, on, uh, on whether economists agree or disagree, and it turned out that uh, actually in the United States they agreed on uh, most, most points. And they, Mr. They, they disagreed to disagree. And Mr. Krugman said that it can it can be true. We all disagree. And one commentator said then that economists can't even agree whether they disagree. So it's really it's really difficult. Uh, let, let us stop here and maybe ask uh, the audience to ask uh, questions to our participants. Uh, and I would ask you to try to ask short questions and uh, re uh, and point out who should answer them, so that there is one one uh, one person uh, answering. I'm Marek Grela. I'm the former ambassador of Poland to the European Union and former EU official. Uh, what strikes me most of today's panel? Very little said about uh, impact of changes in the global economy on uh, Europe's situation of today. We should be aware of, of it that uh, uh, deficiencies of uh, architecture of Euro is important, but it's not the unique factor influencing the today Europe's uh, situation. Second comment is why uh, quite uh, significant uh, European countries, number of European countries, face the problems. Because the euro, uh, from the very beginning, had been uh, projected for the uh, mature, structurally mature economies, or economies with ability to absorb change, to reform. And we face a problem in a number of, uh, uh, in particular, in a number of southern European economies, not so much in Central Eastern Europe, because we are in permanent um, transition from central planned economy to market economy to reforms to, to preparation of, uh, uh, for the European Union, etc. Second problem, which is purely political, is uh, it will be uh, it will be at, at the end second important problem in my view is uh, that final result of the maastricht treaty had been influenced by political consideration linked with german unification if you read uh, the law memoirs which is the most fascinating uh, book about europe's economy of the last 30 years it's uh, crystal uh, 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 clear that this factor influenced extremely strongly. And there were some additional criteria for Maastricht before, but Germany had a choice to agree. If not, no German unification, speaking bluntly. Uh, that uh, problem. Key of Europe's, I'm not pessimistic, I'm um, I, I would avoid this, uh, 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 notions that I'm optimist. The situation remains very serious. We had European Council meeting on 19th of November. Very dramatic. Madame Merkel, as, as you know, Le Monde quoted, said that uh, Eurozone may explode if no structural commitments made by the uh, weakest member states. And the problem remains. In Spain, I, we may discuss after the meeting some details. I was in Spain for a few weeks recently. It's a very serious situation. 
And the last uh, uh, comment is about, about future. Future rests on the situation of the weakest countries, but not only. One should recognize that, if, in my view, the future of Euro project uh, rests today on the future of France. France is not, it's not so much, or not only about French economy, it's very much about the readiness of, of France to transfer some rights to the European institution. Uh, and France is uh, very much against. And the mood in France is very pessimistic. And let me say, it's not just your book. I, 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 I just bought a book, so I don't uh, know the, the, the text. But because I'm reading another book of, of, on this issue, also advising to, to uh, make a face out of, of Euro, published in France by a very respected person in, in French uh, administration, strongly pro-European, uh, Francois Heisbourg, Le fin de ref européen, uh, uh, the end of, of the European dream. So, in my view, French position of, of Euro is a key to, let's say, of Euro as invented uh, in the Maastricht Treaty. Thank you. I would like to ask you to please um, leave the comments for after the debate so that we can discuss in the, uh, after, after the debate is ended. And, and now, uh, is, does anybody want to ask a question? Uh... My name is Mehmet Orhun Eskici. I'm the chairman of Vistula University. First of all, I'm very happy to have such distinguished and differentiated ifs of economists on our campus. Uh, before moving the, the question, it was very uh, interesting debate. And when we saw, when Mr. Salazi mentioned about the uh, depreciation of the Turkish lira and, and the success behind this, I think the 40% of depreciation of Turkish lira against euro is just happened in the one and a half year. And the main success is uh, like is happening with the economic structure and uh, quite political aspiring uh, leadership at that time. And the problems right now we are having with this depreciation is a little bit also the, not, I cannot say like political instability, but uh, some of the democratic reforms in a little bit halted, and it could be the reason. My question is also to uh, uh, Mr. Sarazin, and we saw different views. I was really wondering, and when we saw the, uh, who benefited from Euro? Now, we saw the problems and uh, that happened in different areas. You mentioned that the Germany is not that much affected. It was like a nightmare for many uh, governors of the central bank in the last few years. And uh, who benefited from Euro? And my second question would be related also like the uh, audience with this very practical. We just finished one meeting half an hour ago with our Polish bankers and we are discussing for uh, some credit. Should we get this in Euro or it is better to uh, stay with Zwoti? And this, this part is also related to all uh, economists. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Please. Uh, this is a question uh, which, uh, which cannot be answered. In fact, if one, if one is the scientifically honest, because uh, there is no such thing as counterfactual history. We would have to have a big the computer with all the data of the world, and we, and we would have to set it back to the year 1998 and to, and to type into the computer no euro, and then uh, we, uh, we should see what develops. So there is never a, 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 not a scientifically sound and safe answer what would have happened uh, if something else would have happened. How would the world have turned out if there had not been the murder in Sarajevo? Nobody knows, maybe something even worse would have happened. Nobody knows that. So uh, that what I say was the data that I can observe don't show that the euro has a 
posit has had a positive effect on the, on the German economy. And this, I think this to say is safe. This does not mean uh, that the world would not have out completely differently uh, if, we, if, we did not, if we did not have the euro. Thank you. I just wanted to add, I personally benefited from introduction of euro. <laughs> because when I travel across Europe, I don't have to exchange the currency into many local currencies. So I volunteer for the one who did benefit. And, and, and what about the question uh, on, on, on credit? Which, car, which currency should we take credit in? Maybe for the Poli Polish economist here, uh, Mr. Borowski. I think I would surprise everybody if I gave a direct answer to your question. So, uh, if you are a risk lover and you can face the exchange rate risk, then you can think about borrowing in the euro. Uh, clearly, uh, the best strategy, if you believe in forecasters and the forecast accuracy of the analysts in Poland, you can look at the forecast, the long-term forecast, and, uh, uh, and uh, make some assumptions and finally decide. So, uh, but seriously, I personally believe that uh, Zloty has come back to the medium, actually long-term appreciation trend, because the euro is growing out of the, the euro area is growing out of the troubles, and we are going over the medium term. We are going to see Zloty uh, appreciating. So uh, at, this is a part, the partial answer to your question. Okay, Mr. Piontkowski. Uh, give a similar response on the Polish Zloty Euro exchange rate. But I wanted to respond to the comments by uh, Ambassador Grela on the global impact. I'm not exactly sure what, what you mean by the global impact on, on, on the Eurozone and the Eurozone on the global impact, but I would just wanted to provoke you with an observation that I think what is really not enough emphasized in the global debate is that Europe as a whole has achieved the biggest success in mankind's his history. We Europeans have created the most decent society in the world and in mankind's history. And I think it's incumbent on the Chinese, Brazilians, Americans and every other nation to actually explain how they're gonna catch up with the Europeans in the decency of the societies, not for us to explain why we have done so well. And on France, on France, my answer to you would be, how much worried are you about the recent loss of Borussia Dortmund in the Bundesliga? They lost, I think, the last three games, or at least have not won. Does it mean they're gonna really do badly in this year until the end of the season? Yes or no? Mr. Grela. You will probably say they will make it to the Champions League again, right? And that's what I would say. So I am always amazed, amazed, mind boggled, and outraged that people look at France, they say, right, for the last three years they've been doing so badly, there's fun France is fundamentally broken and they will not work anymore. And they forget that for 1,000 years, France has been the, one of the most powerful nations in the world. In fact, you could argue that probably is the, one of the top most successful three societies in, the, in the mankind's history. And we focus on the last three years, which are totally taken out of context, to argue that, the, that France is coming to be destroyed the, the, the following year or a week. I, I find it totally misplaced, taken out of context. And if you let me to give you a, a long-term perspective, I would say that France will deal with this problem and will move on. Thank you. I see that Mr. Mr. Sarazin is completely surprised of your argument. <laughs> uh, any other question from the? Okay. Uh, Martin Masne, uh, I have uh, two quick questions on Herrn Sarazin. Uh, the first uh, question is, how should we pronounce your name? Sarazin, Sarazin, we don't know it. Sarazin. I, I know, I know it. Uh, but, but how should we pronounce your name? How should we pronounce your name? 
Sarazin. Good. Yeah. And the, uh, the other question is, uh, what's good and what's bad in the ideas of the Alternative für Deutschland? Uh, nicht nur... Um, AfD, which is, a, which is a new party, has, uh, has some, uh, some uh, the very good economists under the leaders, the, between the leaders, and I think they are, they are pretty competent on, on the matters of the euro. On the other hand, the party is uh, the new, and it is still not stable. So, uh, uh, I don't know whether that they will succeed and find a stable form for themselves, and this is a condition that they will succeed in the long run. Thank you. I think we have the time for one more question, and we'll, we'll finish with that. Uh, Robert Lach, Vistula University. Um, as it is very difficult to have an agreement on the past, uh, I would like to make it even more schizophrenic and to uh, ask something from the crystal ball. Um, Japan devaluates its uh, currency really quickly recently. If we compare it to the uh, cranking uh, speed of the American press, which uh, Fed used to think about the 33% devaluation of a 10 years period officially, then we have uh, Japan with 50% starting from uh, and following the this, this year. So uh, we already see the rise of the inflation in uh, Japan. Uh, obviously, the unpaid liabilities in states are in, at the level of 126 US trillion. So uh, the Fed is, was printing like uh, 85 uh, billions a month. So isn't that, uh, it, couldn't that happen, uh, that, that attempt uh, to raise uh, uh, annual interest rate would be likely to, to happen? Thank you. Personally, well, in, in, certain, in certain core matters, the economist always ends in belief <laughs> and, not in, and not in certain knowledge. Personally, uh, I think that, um, that monetary uh, matters are the less important in the long run uh, for an economy than one usually uh, thinks. What really drives an economy is the uh, size and the quality and the industry of the labor force. This is the quality of the, of the legal framework within a country. This is, uh, this is uh, the level of investment and technical progress. This is, is what, what drives an economy. And, uh, and, monetary, and, and monetary developments uh, are, are mostly developments on the, the the surface, they, uh, they uh, influence the short-term growth, they influence the, uh, the inflation rate, they may influence nominal growth, but they never can change the, uh, the fundamentals. So in the end, uh, whatever, whatever monetary policy takes place in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Japan, it doesn't change the fact that, uh, that Japan has a, a, a population which is shrinking fast and which is getting older. And so in the long term, uh, uh, the Japan will be a no-growth or a slow-growth country. And well, the debt is the internal problem. Thank you. Thank you. I let us, let us stop the debate here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the participants for, 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 uh, for their uh, comments. Um, thank you to, Mr., to, to, to Rector Rybinski for, for, for hosting us. 
and thank you to um, the publishing house Emka, uh, which uh, published the Polish edition of the Mr. Saracen's book, so which provoked the discussion here. Uh, I would like to invite you to the discussions behind behind the doors, so that we can have some more some more uh, mm, uh, more debate. Thank you.